Hello and welcome to the special broadcast by Union Solidarity International. My name is Walton Pantland in Glasgow, Scotland, and I'm joined today by Nora Loretto in Quebec City, Canada. Nora has had a lot of experience organizing in both the student and the union movement, and she has written a book called From Demonized to Organized, Building the New Union Movement, which uh, looks at some of the new movements which are happening within trade unionism in Canada. Um, Nora, thank you for joining us, and can you please tell us what's happening in the labor movement in Canada? Yeah, the, uh, the labor movement right now is under increasing attacks from the conservative government. We have a, a conservative government that's been in power since 2006, uh, and with their majority, they have slowly but deliberately uh, started to increase their tax on organized labor. And so uh, through several omnibus budget bills that have nothing to do with, <laughs> with labor, uh, they've, uh, they've started to uh, increase their intrusion uh, into collective bargaining and, um, and, uh, and expose a lot of some of the weaknesses that do exist within the labor movement in Canada. At the same time, at the provincial level, there's also provincial governments doing the same thing. And so, for example, in Ontario, which is the largest province in Canada, uh, last year, uh, there was, um, there was uh, the, the teachers' federations there, before they even started bargaining, the provincial government uh, interfered in the bar bargaining process, um, illegalized uh, work actions, and forced the teachers to, um, to accept a contract through, through legislation. Uh, now, these actions, most people are saying, are not probably uh, constitutional, but of course, a constitutional challenge takes too long mm -hmm. to be able to immediately react. And so we're seeing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these attacks with increasing intensity, and from a lot of different political parties. Because in Ontario, it's not the Conservative Party; it's the Liberal, the more centrist Liberal Party that that uh, waged that attack. And so um, one of the questions that I ask in the book is, what are the weaknesses that exist within the Canadian labor movement, and why are uh, these attacks coming so strong and so 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 brutal, actually? And one of the conclusions that I that I come up with is the effect that neoliberalism has had on people who are 40 years old and younger has really changed their orientation to collective organizing, which of course means for labor uh, that they have to completely change how they speak and how they reach out to young workers. Mm -hmm. that's, um, th that's really interesting and it sounds like it's not an experience which is unique to Canada. Certainly here in the UK we're seeing uh, very, very similar dynamics um, in um, having a, a right-wing conservative government which is attacking uh, the very basis of, of trade unionism and collective action and uh, communities, the welfare state, all that kind of thing. And I think we're seeing the same across Europe and um, indeed across the world. Um, we also have some of the same problems uh, in, in the labor movement in that uh, essentially the unions as they are were set up to organize a very different kind of workforce. and. We now have, um, as you know, a, a workforce which is increasingly precarious, um, workers who have different ideas about themselves because of the neoliberalism that you've spoken about. Um, can you tell us about some of the new ways of organizing which, uh, which your book identifies? Well, one of the, 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 the goals that I wanted to achieve with the book was to actually blow open the idea that, that we can continue to organize as, as, as usual. Because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of resistance, I'd say, from some folks who've been around in the labor movement for a long time to organizing in new ways because we have tried and true methods and they should work. And of course, there's a lot of wisdom in the old methods um, of organizing. But as you said, with the, ch the changing nature of work um, and with the uh, proliferation of precarious, of precarious and contract work, um, we actually do have to change gears in a significant way. Um, one of the one of the realities is in uh, in Ontario, the most populous region in Ontario, southern Ontario, youth unemployment is actually at 25 percent. And so, um, uh, on top of youth unemployment, of course, we also have a huge problem with youth underemployment. So, highly credentialized workers, a highly credentialized workforce, and not actually able to fill jobs that um, that they've been trained to fill. And so, what the labor movement needs to do, one of the things I argue in the book, is that um, it, it has to go beyond its own membership, and it has to figure out ways to not only start organizing uh, new sectors or different sectors. Um, or sectors that are traditionally just not organized, like um, retail or fast food, 
Um, but they also have to look to, to things that are happening around the world that um, demonstrate possibilities to organize these workers that might be outside of a union structure. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, I talk about um, the, the amazing campaign in the United States around organizing uh, fast food workers where in a lot of cases demanding the minimum wage to be increased to $15 an hour isn't necessarily part of a unionized drive. Um, in some cases it is, in some cases it, it isn't. But um, but unions have gone behind the, the workers and have given them the support that they need to be able to create um, pressure on, on their bosses to, to It's with the our Walmart campaign, where again workers are being organized not into unions but body unions into groups, into associations, uh, or more formalized structures to then attack the, or demand uh, more rights at the workplace. Um, these kinds of responses are really important because when we've got multinational corporations who know exactly how to clamp down on union organizing the second that they get wind that it's happening, um, then we need to be more creative. In, uh, in our responses. Because the tragedy of, of organizing in some of these places, and in, in Canada, for example, there's very few Walmarts uh, organized, the big, the big box store from the United States. Um, and uh, one, one organized Walmart in uh, Western Canada, actually, they just voted after, um, after three years of trying to get their first contract, they voted to decertify. And so these are, these are realities that are wrapped up in the traditional bureaucratic structures that we all are aware of in the labor movement. Um, but we need to get more creative uh, because the bosses know the tools just as well as we do. So we need to come up with new tools to take down a lot of these uh, these policies. Um, this is, I think, particularly a, a problem which, which faces the industrial relations models that we're in, which is kind of the, the Anglo-Saxon ones as opposed to the, the European models where, where um, partnership is more strongly um, uh, part of the way, 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 way those economies function. Um, there has been a turn both in the UK and the US and I think Canada towards uh, social movement unionism and community unionism. For example, the, the union in the UK, Unite, has a new membership um, category called community membership, which is for people who are not in um, ordinary organized employment. And I know that the AFL-CIO at uh, their recent uh, conference took a decision to allow organizations to affiliate to the AFL-CIO, which are not unions, um, uh, charities and and NGOs and and, and other kinds of progressive organizations. Do you think that this is a move in the right direction? Is this the kind of thing that you're referring to, or is it something else that unions need to be doing? Well, it's it's similar things are happening in Canada as well. And so in um, in, uh, the the end of August, there is the creation of of a new union that uh, formed out of the old Canadian auto workers and the Communication and Energy Papers Workers Union uh, to form the largest private sector union in Canada. And and while a lot of the information about the new union was was tied to the, the existence of the old unions, the most exciting thing that people picked up on out of that uh, out of the creation of the new union, which is called Unifor, uh, was their intention to do the exact same thing to organize people in community chapters. Um, I think the community chapter model is is an important response to uh, to this destruction, to this attack on community that we that we see and can uh, and have experienced. Um, it's it's a difficult question though how to actually make it work because um, I know uh, currently in the aftermath of the creation of the new union, a lot of people are debating how exactly you can give voice to people. Uh, can you can give you can give real voice or, or, or give them a fundamental way to involve themselves within the works of the union while also being uh, on the fringes really mm-hmm. and so it's uh, it's a model that's that's new and that um the first the first community chapter is actually an existing um quasi local of the old communication energy paper workers union it's the canadian freelance union of which i'm a member um, and we really, time will tell to see uh, how, how well this model works for the Canadian freelance union members who are all freelance communications workers, either journalists or web designers or graphic designers or whatever. Um, but the reality is, is that for any of these to work, uh, you need to have the, the resources put into organizing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's a really important aspect to this. It's not good enough to just 
uh, have these structures exist and tell people, well, it's important to be a part of it because it's important to be a part of it. <laughs> Uh, we have to actually give people services. We have to demonstrate to people the the reason for why that they would they would join such a, a chapter. But that also means that we need to dedicate the resources to organizers and organizing to make sure that people are brought together in a cohesive way that makes sense and that um, that does give them voice within the labor movement. So um, it's a question not just of uh, strategy and structure, but of um, putting the funding, putting the resources into supporting it. Um, you've spoken about the the importance of unions adopting a new model to appeal to workers who are, who are under 40, to younger workers. Um, what about other groups who are underrepresented in the labor movement? And I'm thinking particularly of uh, women, uh, migrant workers, um, and uh, other groups who, who are marginali marginalized both within the union movement and uh, within the workforce generally. What, what can unions be doing for, for those groups of people? And do you think that it's important to focus on on those groups to, to grow union strength? Yeah, the, after um, several years of, of experimenting with how to change union structures to make them more representative, I think that um, that still to this day, if you go to a national union convention, you'll see that the membership is still not as representative um, as the membership at the grassroots. Um, and that is uh, talking primarily of, of unionized workers, not even talking about workers who are not unionized, who um, are, are absolutely not reflected. Um, in those structures. Uh, unions have to be very honest about where those structures have succeeded and where they have failed. Um, and, and ask, uh, are, are committees um, formed uh, to, to enhance the, the, the participation of marginalized workers, are those given the proper resources and given the proper prominence within the union to actually have an influence, or are they kind of hiding off that work uh, to, be part of a, to be part of a committee? Certainly for, for young workers, I think the, the, the benefit of, of having those experiences with other marginalized workers can inform how to move forward. But if you go to young workers committees, it, again, they're not, they're not representative really in my experience. Um, it's a lot of people who had ex exposure or experience with the union already and who didn't need to be convinced um, and, uh, and who who have who are already part of the I guess the converted or whatever, which isn't which isn't good enough because of course we need to make sure that everyone is around the table. Um, now, when we're looking at the sectors that aren't unionized, um, especially if you look at retail fast food sectors um, in the major cities in Canada, those are where of course you've got a, a majority of workers who are women, high number of workers who are racialized, um, and and high numbers of workers who are not unionized. Um, so the, the unions who are working to organize those workspaces, uh, in, in Canada, the, the United Food and Commercial Workers are doing uh, really good work organizing retail workers, fast food workers, and migrant workers. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. But we're so siloed within our unions mm -hmm. that that work doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have any influence on the, the larger public sector unions, uh, or vice versa. The, the large public sector unions who have a, um, a majority of, uh, of women as their members um, and, and have excellent policies uh, that, that come out of that, that reality and do a lot of good work around issues that, that some might consider to be women's issues. Um, that doesn't necessarily extend to the private sector unions where they've got large manufacturing uh, uh, work bases that tend to be predominantly male. Um, so when you've got uh, our workforce in general segmented in such a way, um, and that, that necessarily means that our unions are probably going to be somewhat segmented in that way too. We need to figure out a better way to break down the silos between those unions um, and, and actually uh, bring together the experiences that, that workers from all sectors and workers from all backgrounds have. Uh, Nora, this sounds like exactly the kind of debate that the union movement needs to have. Where can we get your book? Uh, you can order it online through the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is uh, www.policyalternatives.ca. Um, or if you uh, want to connect with me directly, you can email me at noraloretto at gmail.com, it's just my name, and, uh, and I, can get, uh, I can get you connected to the folks to, to, get, to, to get copies of the book. And I, I have a, a copy here, so this is what it looks like. That's fantastic. Well done. That is precisely what the union movement needs, is loads of ideas. So thank you for writing that book, and thank you for telling us about it. Thank you.